beautiful, beautiful, beautiful people. Today, we are going to look at Japan, black ship diplomacy. We will take a look at the Tokugawa shogunate, early Japanese Western relations, how Japan was forced to open its doors to Western trade, the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate, and finally, the Meiji restoration. Let us begin. Let us commence. All right. We are going east. We are going far, far east. East of China. Yes, indeed. Japan. Japan. On the far, far, far outer reaches of the Eurasian continent. Japan by 1600. Japan is anything but united uh, in 1600 or prior to 1600, we're going to get there, by 1600, okay. It is made up of a number of uh, 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 provinces, domains of men called daimyos, which are warlords. Uh, the emperor certainly exists, but since the 11th century has been largely powerless. A symbolic and religious leader, certainly uh, considered divine, um, God on earth, literally, but largely powerless. The real power is in uh, the hands of these feudal lords, these daimyos, uh, that is the imperial standard of the emperor of Japan. Again, symbolic, religious, greatly esteemed, but powerless. The power lies in these warlords, daimyos. Uh, this is an approximation of the territorial layout of Japan during this time. This is feudalism. This is feudalism with each chief warlord battling one another. This is the warring period of Japan, the 1500s. Japan is anything but united. That soon will change. However, however, if one thing unites the Japanese people, it is Shintoism. This is the predominant religion with, with great influences of Buddhism from China. Just please know that Chinese uh, culture greatly influences Japan for, for, for throughout its history, much like Rome influenced the rest of Europe for, for many, many centuries. However, the Japanese, and they still have this to a large degree, can take certain aspects of different cultures, but still remain very much Japanese. And this is what the Japanese do uh, when they take, when they borrow so much from China. But Shintoism is the predominant faith of the Japanese in the uh, period that we are discussing right now. Shintoism is a kind of nature worship in a sense. Uh, the spirits of gods do live in, in living things, even non-living things, trees, rocks. However, evil spirits do exist, and Shintoism, its practice, uh, seeks to get rid of these evil spirits but divinity is found in nature very much so the harmony the order of nature um shinto temples oftentimes are surrounded by nature within nature and again their ceremonies so often have to do with um cleansing one's surroundings of these evil spirits Japanese society, well, approximately 10% were members of the aristocracy, the ruling class, um, the samurai class, as they could be called. Um, that is not to say that there weren't poor samurai. There certainly were. There certainly were. But you had certain privileges, definitely, and you were considered a member of the ruling class. Now, Japanese society in 1600 is incredibly stratified. Many different classes within Japanese society. But the vast majority, uh, the broader uh, class they belong to is the peasant class. Now, you can be a merchant in the peasant class. You can be a, um, a craftsman in the peasant class. But usually, usually you are a farmer working the Lord's land, working the Lord's land. Again, think European feudalism. However, however... Japan is finally unified under the Tokugawa shogunate. This man, Iyasu, is made shogun of Japan following a very, very, very deadly civil war. One by one, one by one, this man conquers the other daimyos of Japan and make him 
make them subservient to him. He is the man who unifies Japan uh, in the early 1600s, and he is proclaimed shogun, the master warlord uh, by the emperor. Again, the emperor is powerless um, as far as having an army or a true ruling government, but very much esteemed, very much a living God. And so you need his approval. Well, you don't need, but it adds legitimacy to uh, the Tokugawa rule. This will usher in, this will usher in approximately 200 years of peace, a very, very peaceful uh, time for Japan. But this is also the time that Japan is going to come into contact with Westerners with Europeans. We'll get there. We will get there. There is Tokugawa in Japan. One by one, he conquers his enemies. He hunts down and eliminates any remnants of resistance. He gives out land to vassals who are loyal to him and takes away land to men from men who are not loyal to him. He consolidates his rule over the early 1600s. Hundreds. The political structure of Tokugawa, Japan. Well, he establishes a new political feudal system with himself as the uh, war lord, the warlord of warlords, the royal governor, not, not royal. Aha, I shouldn't say royal, the governor. Let's just keep it with governor. Uh, again, the emperor is technically the only royal. Um, he is very much esteemed, but symbolic and religious. He divides Japan into domains headed by Daimyo, although this time they're loyal to him. Um, you are awarded, you are awarded this land, but you have to provide troops to the shogun. Um, very similar again to what we see in Europe. These are the Daimyo territories of Tokugawa, Japan. Yellow is held directly by the shogun and every other color are um, subservient to him. Again, he's the chief warlord. He is the king of kings in, 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 in a European uh, way of speaking. Here's a daimyo procession marching all of his troops. Remember though, they are subservient to the shogun. Now, this is a very interesting system. This is very similar to what we had at Versailles. Very similar. Very, very, very interesting. The Sankin Kotai system. What is that? Well, the goal of the Sankin Kotai system is to ensure loyalty and remove any possibility of a rival daimyo emerging. What is the system? Well, each daimyo must reside in alternate years from his domain one year, and then at the Imperial Palace, uh, not the Imperial Palace, sorry, pardon me, the Shogunate Palace um, in Edo. So this is to prevent these daimyos from uh, gaining too much power in their region. For the year that they're not living at the Shogunate Palace, um, they have to leave family members with the Shogun. And this is uh, a way uh, to ensure that you will not rebel against the shogun. You have to leave family, I mean, pretty much as hostages at Edo with the shogunate on those years that you are not present at court. This is a Japanese Versailles. And for the same reasons that Louis XV did it um, in his land, uh, the Tokugawa do the same thing in Japan. It keeps the nation centralized, all the power is at Edo Castle, and it keeps the daimyos from gaining too much power and remaining beholden to the shogun. There is Edo. You were expected to live in the castle complex. This is, of course, a recreation. There we go. A massive complex. We want to divorce the daimyo from their domain in many ways. Keep them loyal to the shogun, the seat of power. Massive parades when these daimyo would march to Edo. They would take with them their servants, 
uh, their, 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 their vassals. And so you would see these massive parades going through the countryside of Japan on their way to Edo to live for that year with the shogun. Early Japanese Western relations. Well, the first mention <coughs> of Japan um, is in the writings of Marco Polo, the merchant traveler who went to uh, Kublai Khan, China, um, in the 1300s, learned of some islands off of the coast. He never visits, but he wrote this, Marco Polo, in the 1300s. The... Uh, People on the island of Zimpangu, that's Japan, have tremendous quantities of gold. The king's palace is roofed with pure gold, and his floors are paved in gold two fingers thick. That is all we have of Japan from Marco Polo. Uh, we do know that China, um, ruled by the Mongols, Kublai Khan at this time, uh, did import large amounts of gold from the islands of Japan. Uh, in 1492... In 1492, Columbus was certain that he was just short of reaching Japan when he arrived in the Caribbean, just short. Of course, we know he was here, but he thought he was either here, 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 here. Again, he did not know of the uh, large landmass in between Europe and the uh, East Asian uh, seaboard. The first nation, the first nation to come into contact with Japan were the Portuguese. Now, you know the Portuguese had, had settled outposts along the coast of Africa, India, and we know they kept going to the Spice Islands, and they make their way to Japan in 1543. The objective of the Portuguese, well, two things, trade and souls. We want to make money, and we also want to spread the word of the Gospels for the Roman Catholic Church. Here is a map of Southeast Asia, uh, by the Portuguese, but we can see Japan here in the north. The Japanese have some lovely paintings of their first meetings with these newcomers. The Japanese marveled at some of the technologies that the Portuguese had. These large seafaring ships, strange clothes, strange accents, rifles that shot at ferocious speeds. We can see here a black slave, or at least a servant of the Portuguese. The Japanese also were horrified at the big, great beards that the Westerners had. They called Westerners monkeys or dogs oftentimes, uh, not in a nice way, not in a nice way at all. Early Christianity in Japan. Well, Christian missionaries arrived with the Portuguese. It was Francis Xavier and the Jesuits who arrived in the 1540s. Um, and for a brief time, Christianity enjoys some popularity. Even some daimyos become Christian. Um, by 1614, by 1614, there were approximately 250,000 Christian converts in Japan. At first, they were welcomed by the uh, uh, daimyos and later the shogun. Number one, Westerners in general uh, meant more wealth. And the Christian missionaries were uh, seen as a way to weaken the strength of, of Buddhist monks that were growing quite powerful in the islands. And so it was seen as a counterbalance to the Buddhist monks that were wielding more and more influence in the country. So at first, at first, it was encouraged. Not encouraged. I won't say encouraged. I take that back. Tolerated. I'll just say tolerated. Not encouraged. Tolerated. But up to a quarter million converts by 1614. And then the Tokugawa shogun um, changes his mind. He changes his mind. Uh, now, now that Japan is unified, increasingly, the shogun, who has retired by 1614, but for the is still wielding tremendous power, um, 
decides that these Christian missionaries need to be expo- uh, 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 expelled. On top of that, Christians in general need to be expelled, both Japanese and Western Christians. They were seen as creating disharmony within the uh, Japanese society. Furthermore, the Japanese could see what was happening. They got reports of what was happening in the Philippines, in parts of India, and they saw this as a way to be colonized. And so they greatly uh, feared that these Christian missionaries were a disharmonious disharmonious force. Furthermore, the shogun was very, very suspicious of having hundreds of thousands of subjects who were perhaps not loyal to him, but perhaps loyal to the Pope in Rome. And so it was decided, decided that they had to go. We cannot have a nation within a nation. We cannot have hundreds of thousands of people within my domain who perhaps their loyalty is questionable. Many thousands of Japanese Christians were forced to flee to either Portuguese Macau or the Spanish Philippines. Uh, Persecutions were uh, unleashed on the Christians of Japan. In 1632, 55 Christians were martyred in Nagasaki. In 1637, there was an uprising of about 40,000 Christian peasants, which resulted in further persecution. Here are the martyrs of Nagasaki put to death by Japanese authorities. This is a European engraving. It is now by the middle 1600s that the Japanese enter into the age of Sokoku. What is Sokoku? It means isolationism essentially. And from 1641 to 1853, Japan sought to radically limit trade and interactions with most of the world. Until 1868, in fact, it was illegal to leave Japan without permission from the government. Through a series, through a series of shogunate edicts, Japan becomes increasingly isolated from the West. We do not need your things. We do not want your things. However, However, trade was uh, limited. It was what didn't become non-existent. It was not entirely closed off. Um, there was limited trade and diplomatic relations with Korea, China, and Holland. It is decided that Holland we can deal with. We can deal with the Dutch. The Dutch were not interested in being missionaries, and they couldn't leave certain posts in certain cities. They were not allowed to freely trade within the country or enter uh, outside of the city of Nagasaki. Trade was limited to just the Dutch, although there was trade with Korea and China, just not Western powers. Here is a Japanese illustration of a Dutch ship. A trading post at Nagasaki. And again, the Dutch were up and down the um, East Asian seaboard, South China Sea, into India. They were the least intrusive in the eyes of the Japanese. We could deal with the Dutch, no one else. A fantastic illustration of a Hollander, a Dutchman. Motivations. Well, the Portuguese and the Spanish were seen as potential colonizers. And this is what the Japanese were trying to avoid. Also political motivations. We don't want open trade with foreigners because we don't want certain daimyos to become too powerful. We want all trade to come through the city of Nagasaki. And so the shogun can control this and not allow any particular daimyo to become too powerful. If I can control all trade and communication with the outside world through one city, Nagasaki, then I can control Japan. Remember, this is all about stability. We do not want to return to the warring period. The effects of this very restricted trade. Well, the culture of Japan develops within a very, very, very limited influence from the outside world. By the 1700s, 
By the 1700s, more and more Western powers are knocking at the door, however. They want to open up trade with Japan. And it is going to take a new power to force this. It is going to take a new power to force Japan open. Let's see who that new power is. Oh, oh, the Americans. Finally, finally, we have the Americans enter the international playground, forcing the door open. In 1849, in 1849, Captain James Glynn sailed to Nagasaki. His mission was to open up Japan for trade. He fails although he does succeed in having um, some American sailors freed. They were uh, shipwrecked and taken prisoner by the Japanese. He frees the prisoners, but he returns to Washington, D.C., and he tells the American uh, congressman that we need to return to Japan and ask again, but we need to bring force with us. We need to show them that we are a nation to be taken seriously. And so another mission, another mission is, is sent out to Japan. This is a time when the Americans were full of nationalism, full of, of confidence. They had just uh, 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 signed a treaty with the British, giving the Americans Oregon country, the great Northwest. They had also just fought a war from 1846 to 1848 with the new nation of Mexico, which had taken from Mexico approximately half of its territory from sea to shining sea. And now the Americans are looking across the sea to Japan, to China. We are reaching out. We are reaching out. And we are going to give Japan no real choice in this. I am talking about, of course, the Perry Expedition. Commodore Matthew Perry will be the man that the United States sends to Japan. Uh, he had served honorably in several wars, including the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War. And it is he that we send to the uh, 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 island of Japan. His mission was to force Japan to open up trade to U.S. traders and guarantee safety for any sailors in the future that might find themselves in Japan. And this is when we get the arrival of the black ships. Now, black ships in Japan would later come to symbolize uh, a threat imposed by Western technology. They want to see these ships appearing. Now, they're called black ships because they were steel clad. I'm not steel, ironclad ships, modern technology. We have ironclad American ships. Perry arrives near the capital city of Edo. At Edo, Perry was met with representatives from the Tokugawa shogunate who told him to proceed to Nagasaki. This is where foreigners go. You can't come to Edo. It is the only city uh, open to foreigners. Perry gives the Japanese a white flag and a letter from the president. And he says, I'll be back. I'll be back. Fly this white flag. Read this letter from the president. I'll be back to settle terms with you. Just be careful because if I want to, I can destroy your coasts. And he certainly could. The Japanese were years behind the Americans at this point. Here is Matthew Perry's black ship. The Japanese marveled at their technology. This is the equivalent of a spaceship coming down to earth today. He left with the Japanese a, le a letter written by the president, Millard Fillmore, says, I am going to China, but I'll be back. I'll be back for your answer, for your response. Now, the Japanese at first prepared for war, but then they very quickly realized we are in no position. We are in no position to make war with this Commodore and this United States. We are years behind them in technology. You can see this is a wooden cannon built. Um, now is not the time. Now is not the time. And so in 1854, Perry returns with twice as many ships. He found that the Japanese delegates had prepared a treaty agreeing to virtually all of the demands that were laid in the president's letter. Perry demanded to meet the Shogun personally, and he's told no, no one does that. And he's 
agrees. Okay. Uh, maybe I asked too much. All right. All right. Fair enough. Um, but he returns to the United States, a hero. Um, he had forced Japan to open up its doors. What were the terms that the Americans wanted under this peace? Uh, it was called the treaty of the, the, P, the treaty of peace and amity. What were the terms? Well, it opened up the Japanese ports of Shimoto and Hagodate. Um, let me show you a map. There we go. It opens up those two ports for Americans to refuel and trade in, and it guaranteed the safety of shipwrecked U.S. sailors. This is exactly what the Americans want, and they got it. They got it. Uh, Matthew Perry returns to the United States, a hero. Congress grants him uh, $20,000. That's about $700,000 today. Um, he returns to the United States, a hero. However, that's not enough for the Americans. They want more. They want more. In 1858, they're going to get more. They are going to get more. In 1856, another U.S. envoy arrived to negotiate with the government of Japan. It took two years of negotiation. At the same time, the British are negotiating with the Japanese, being very heavy-handed with the Japanese. And finally, the Japanese agree to the Harris Treaty. What were the terms? Well, number one, we're going to exchange diplomats. Number two, we're going to open up all of these other cities to American foreign trade. Number three, we want the ability of U.S. citizens to live and trade in those ports. Number four, a system of extraterritoriality territoriality for the Americans there. That means they're under American law, not Japanese law. Five, fixed low import export taxes. And finally, the right to send missionaries into Japan. All of these were agreed upon. Again, Japan, Japan is in no real position to negotiate. They see what's happening in China, um, and it appears that the same thing is happening to them. They are having the door forced open. It was following the Harris Treaty and during the Harris Treaty um, that other European powers move in and force unequal treaties on Japan. Um, the British do it. The French do it. The Russians do it. Even the Dutch do it. Japan is forced to sign a series of unequal treaties, meaning it was much better terms for the Europeans and the Americans than it was for the Japanese. Quite humiliating in many respects. The effects. Well, it ended, these unequal treaties ended 200 years of seclusion, and it begins to really chip away at the esteem of the Tokugawa shogunate. Many Japanese begin to question the shogun, question his policies, and question the policies of his leading ministers. More and more foreigners find their way into Japan. More and more Japanese trading houses have British, American, Dutch, French, the fall of the Tokugawa shogunate. The last shogun we can see here is Tokugawa Yoshinobu. Very bad at this, I know. 14 years after the arrival of Perry's black ships, the Tokugawa shogunate will collapse. What is the background on the collapse of the Tokugawa shogunate? Over the first half of the 1800s, Tokugawa had lost much of his control, much of their control. I keep calling him one person, right? You know that there are there are different shoguns throughout this time. Um, the shoguns had lost much control over their uh, 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 lands. Regional daimyos had increased in power and prestige. Uh, things came to an end, to a head when Japan signed those unequal treaties. The emperor traditionally outside of politics, spoke out against these unequal treaties. Traditionally, the emperor didn't say anything political, but even the emperor is now speaking out against these unequal, humiliating treaties. Younger samurais 
frustrated and outside of the political system started a movement. It was called Revere the Emperor, Expel the Barbarians. Revere the Emperor, Expel the Barbarians. In reaction, the Tokugawa government executed and imprisoned rebel samurai and forced them out of government. At the same time, at the same time, the Tokugawa government is bringing in French troops to train their military. They're trying to pull farther away from traditional samurai uh, uh, troops. Uh, they're trying to modernize. The Tokugawa government, to be fair, does try to modernize. These are French military officers who were invited to Japan to train and modernize the Japanese army. It's going to be too late. There is the last Shogun in French military uniform, 1867. What kicks off the collapse of the Tokigawa? Well, it was the Sakura Damon incident. The Sakura Damon incident. This man, this man who was largely responsible for the uh, unequal treaties. He was a very big supporter of the unequal treaties. And he was arguing in favor of fully reopening Japan to foreign influences. Well, this man, uh, E. Naosuke, was making his way to the Edo palace of the Shogun when a group of samurais descend on him and they hack him. They hack him to death. They hack him to death. Uh, before they are um, caught or imprisoned, they commit suicide. This group of samurais, 17 samurais, ambu ambushed this man. But they leave a note. They leave a manifesto. They say why they did what they did. It's very, very, very enlightening. This is from the manifesto left by the samurai who killed that minister. While fully aware of the necessity for some change in policy since the coming of the Americans, it is entirely against the interests of the country and a stain on the national honor to open up commercial relations with foreigners, to admit foreigners into the castle, to conclude treaties with them, to abolish the established practice of trampling on the picture of Christ, to allow foreigners to build palaces of worship for their evil religion, and to allow three foreign ministers to reside in the land. Therefore, we have consecrated ourselves to be the instruments of heaven to punish this wicked man, and we have taken on ourselves the duty of ending a serious evil by killing this atrocious autocrat. My God, they didn't pull any punches, did they? They are part of the joy sentiment. Expel the barbarians, revere the emperor. We need to get rid of all of these foreign influences, and we need to put the emperor where he should be at the front of our government. The effects, well, the assassination makes international news. Westerners are looking at this with concern. What in the heck's happening in Japan? We're making a lot of money there. What is happening? This affected samurai rally around the emperor. Japanese politics becomes much more factionalized. In the end, the government, the government begins to collapse. Increasingly powerful daimyo lost their faith in the Tokugawa shogunate and called for a return of imperial rule. This is what's happening. It's beginning to collapse. It's beginning to collapse. Uh, and more and more, Japanese samurai and daimyo are asking for the emperor to be made the head of Japan. This leads to the Boshin War. The Boshin War. This is a civil war in Japan fought between the forces of the shogunate and the forces of the emperor, the daimyo that have thrown themselves around the emperor. The daimyo supported the new young emperor, Meiji, who took the throne in 1867. His father had died. Now, the Tokugawa forces were smaller, but they were much better trained, uh, better armed. Both sides are going to have Western weapons, as well as traditional Japanese weapons. This civil war is, this is it. Are we going to continue to be ruled by a shogun, or are we going to unify ourselves around the beloved emperor? Thousands will die in this war. Here is a group of samurai fighting for the emperor. This is a fantastic time in Japanese history, because it really is a foot in both worlds.
the old world, you have samurai swords, but you also have French artillery. Uh, you also have uh, 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 British rifles. A hundred and twenty thousand men were mobilized during this conflict. Up to four thousand were killed. Now, in the end, just so you know, just so you know, the shogun realized that it was a futile situation and turned over political power to the emperor. Just so you know, and very cleverly, very cleverly, the Tokugawa supporters were granted clemency and many of its leaders found positions in the new government, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But again, feet in two worlds. There is the young Meiji emperor. This is the boy emperor that the daimyo have rallied around. The effects. Well, it was the end of 250 years of Tokugawa rule, the end of an era. The imperial capital was moved to Edo, renamed Tokyo, which means Eastern capital. It established a new government under the Meiji emperor and his imperial council made up of powerful daimyo who have the real power in Japan, just so you know. At this time, a small group of very powerful daimyo controlled and influenced the young emperor a tremendous amount. They soon abandoned their goal of expelling Westerners and instead sought to renegotiate those unequal treaties and sought to modernize the nation rather than reject the West. Why don't we modernize and renegotiate those treaties? Because otherwise we're just going to fall farther and farther behind, which takes us to the Meiji Restoration. The Meiji Restoration, 1868 to 1912. Over the next decades, Japan transforms itself with a series of reforms into a modern state and remained independent. That is the opposite of what happens with China. They see China and they decide, wait, we need to modernize. We need to modernize. China has been carved up over the 1800s. We saw how the British, the Russians, the French carved up China. Japan saw if they can do that to the Chinese, of course they can do that to us. We need to modernize before they're allowed to do such a thing. We don't want to be a China. We certainly do not want to be a China. Centralization. Centralization. The first thing that needs to be done is we need to centralize the state. And so they abolish the uh, domain system. Remember, those daimyos were always dangerous. Um, and they re they introduced a prefecture system. Uh, they replaced those daimyos uh, with Governors appointed by the emperor, and so they are loyal to the emperor rather than their region, and they're always from a different region, and so we want to prevent strong men from rising. Social reforms. Well, the goal of the social reforms was to gain support from the lower classes and remove the strength of the samurai class, that 10%. And so they undergo a series of social reforms. One of the first things that the Meiji government does was make it so that aristocrats can now marry commoners. Commoners can now marry aristocrats. We are trying to break down those strict social levels to gain support from the lower classes. Common people were given the right to wear formal apparel and to travel freely on horseback. The lowest castes of Japan, the Eta and the Hin, were abolished. The Hin were entertainers, guards, beggars. The Eta were those who worked with animal skins, leather goods. Those lowest castes are abolished. The government abolished the right of the samurai to cut down commoners with immunity. You can't simply cut someone down uh, if you don't like the way they looked at you, Samurai. I'm terribly sorry. Samurai lost the right to wear swords, and the daimyo and the Samurai were now paid pensions. You're paid pensions. You're, you're, you're good. You're retired. They're not going to go away, though. The Samurai class is not going to go away without a fight. Please keep that in mind. Increasingly, the Samurai class is bitter. 
hostile and without a place in this modernizing world. The Iwakura mission, the Iwakura mission was a diplomatic journey around the world. What Japan does is it sends a number of officials and students across the world. They are to look at factories, universities, militaries, industries of all kinds, and take back with them what they've learned and so that they can help Japan modernize. And so this mission from 1871 to 1873 uh, went throughout the world. Another goal of this mission was to renegotiate those unequal treaties with the United States and the uh, Europeans. It was headed by Iwakura Tomomi. Let's borrow from the world. Take what we want, what helps us, but only that. And the Japanese to this day are very adept at that. We know, we know um, the Japanese didn't invent the car, but they certainly helped make it better. Televisions, cell phones, um, you name it. The Japanese are very good, very adept at taking a technology, taking anything and, 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 and making it better and making it their own. We see that today. The tour. Well, they set off. They land in San Francisco and they make their way across the United States into Europe, South Asia. Here is San Francisco in the 1870s. They marveled at the buildings, marveled at the technologies. They got themselves new clothes. And then they set out across the country on the newly built transcontinental railroad. They must have wondered, marveled at the sheer size of this land. The Americans were busy conquering and settling the West at this time. Natives being pushed more and more into reservations, being forced to adopt the ways of uh, the white man. They would have passed through mining towns, ranching cow towns. It would be like us visiting Mars. Unbelievable. Across the Great Plains that still had buffalo, although they were being decimated at this point um, in an effort to win the war against the Great Plains Native Americans, also, the rail companies were very much responsible for the death of those giant, giant herds into the Ohio Valley, finally into Washington, D.C. It must have been so strange to be on that mission. Here is an Easter egg hunt at the White House, 1870s. On to London. On to London. Now, they were there before the building of the Tower Bridge, but I guess I came across this image and I guess thought I would share it. This was started in the 1880s and it wasn't completed until the 1890s Tower Bridge, although it's built to make it look like it's been there forever, right? Uh, but again, it's part of that romantic, neo-Gothic nationalist movement of the 1800s that we looked at in the previous lesson. It was in London that they visited Savile Row. Now, Savile Row is still very much known for its men's suits. And today, today, in Japanese language, the word sebiro is, uh, comes from the word Savile or Savile Row. They literally entered the Japanese language because that became synonymous with where you got a suit. They visited Paris. They visited Berlin. They come back with all of this wealth of knowledge, all of this wealth of knowledge, which allows Japan to reform itself. One of the first things it does is educational reforms. New schools and universities were established on the Prussian and the American model. They copied the Prussians and the Americans. Elementary education was made universal, and four years of secondary schooling was made compulsory, with each school year consisting of about four months. In 1872, only 
of those of school age attended. By 1878, it was up to 40%. By 1890, 64% of boys went to primary school. 31% of girls went to primary school. By 1905, 90% of girls went to primary school. 94% of boys went to primary school. By 1925, Japan achieved what no Western country had achieved by that time, and that was almost universal literacy. People could read and write up in the upper 90th percentile. That is something we did not have in the United States or even Western Europe at the time. An absolute marvel. What about this new government of Japan, the Meiji government? What sort of constitution are we going to have? They studied all the different governments. What kind of government would work best for Japan? Now, automatically, the French and the American model, no. Those are republics. We have an emperor. That Don't be ridiculous. The British do have a king, but he's or she at this time, pardon me, Victoria, uh, doesn't have any power. No, 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 no. What model, what model do the Japanese see and go, we like that, we like that. The Prussian model, the pre-unified German Prussian model. They copy, they copy the uh, constitution of Prussia from 1850. They like the Prussian model. They liked the Prussian model. Under... The new Meiji constitution, the emperor was sacred and unchallengeable. Number two, the emperor was given direct command of the armed forces. Number three, the emperor was in charge of appointing the prime minister and his cabinet. Number four, the emperor could dissolve the lower house at will and issue edicts directly to the upper house. Furthermore, the treasury, number five, the treasury was run by the imperial family itself. The lower house was given the authority to approve budgets and pass laws, but the upper house had the power to approve any new laws. And guess what? The emperor was able to had the the emperor was responsible for appointing the upper house, the so-called uh, House of Lords, the upper house in the United States. It's the Senate. What he does with this a uh, 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 power is he creates a whole new uh, ruling class, a nobility that he appoints. This is a government that is fully run by the emperor and his council of very, very influential um, uh, chiefs. By 1890, by 1890, um, suffrage, male suffrage, was about 5% of the population. They put a money requirement on who could vote or run for office in this country. So you have a ruling class. You have a ruling class of elites uh, who are involved in government. Absolutely amazing what Japan is able to do at this time. There is the royal family. One foot in Europe and one foot in traditional Japan. You can see by their uh, attire. Economic reforms. Well, by the time of the Meiji Restoration, Japan is still an incredibly rural country. Uh, most people um, are living hand to mouth in the countryside. Well over 80% of the uh, Japanese population live in the countryside. It was a feudal society for thousands of years, but Japan goes about reforming. They begin to reform. They begin to um, abolish a uh, 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 movement of people. They begin to allow people to buy their own farms, to tend their own crops. This is a revolution in Japan. And they begin to produce more and more food. For example, for example, um, in 1884, rice production was at 149 million bushels of corn a bushel is 45 pounds don't even worry about this i'm just trying to tell you it got a lot more uh by 18 uh, sorry by 1935 they were producing 316 million bushels of uh, 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 of, of rice they developed banks post offices roads bridges they completely they completely dedicate themselves to modernizing they take over 
the silk trade, they begin to dominate. By the late 1800s, they surpassed China in exports of silk. They built factories, mills, absolutely revolutionary how quickly they were able to do this. Here are silk workers in the early 1900s. They move factories into Japan. Absolutely amazing. And because they started from scratch, they really were able to pick the best from each. The, 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 it was very advantageous to start so late. Train system was established in Japan. In 1872, they had 18 miles of track. By 1894, more than 2,000 miles of track. By 1934, 14,500 14 miles of rail track. They lay down telegraph lines. They go into chemical production, glass production, cement production. Absolutely revolutionary. Amazing. The effects. Well, with better food, with more food, better hygiene, their population explodes. 1868, 30 million people in Japan. By 1900, 45 million people in Japan. By 1940, 73 million people in Japan. By the 1920s, much of Japan, uh, Japanese population has become urbanized. They've moved into cities. They read newspapers, although heavily censored newspapers. Uh, they go to school, heavily censored textbooks. Uh, they go to the movies. They drink beer. They have savings accounts. They are modernized. They have modernized by the 1920s, an absolute miracle. However, however, in the late 1800s, before Japan looks to the rest of Asia, it decides to conquer its nearest neighbors, the Ainu. The Ainu. Now, who are the Ainu? Who are the Ainu? Well, the Ainu are Aboriginal, non-Japanese people who once inhabited half of the Japanese island down here, but they've been pushed further and further and further and further north. Uh, they are located mostly in Hokkaido, the island above Japan. Japan decides to um, colonize Hokkaido. They do this for a number of reasons. Number one, they don't want Russia to take it. Russia has its eyes on those islands. Number two, they need something for the samurai to do. So they send them to go and force these people to uh, uh, give up their land. And finally, number four, they want to develop more and more agriculture in their country. That's wasted land, according to the Japanese. Here is the map of the Ainu people and their language dialect distribution. The Ainu... Um, are a mysterious people. Um, they most likely worshipped bears, or it was at least very sacred to these Aboriginal people. Uh, the Japanese knew of the Ainu uh, in the 16 and 1700s. They uh, tried to assimilate them. They tried to force them into marriages with the Japanese um, through disease. Many of the Ainu had died, but they still have a stronghold on Hokkaido, known as the bear people to the Japanese. This is a Western drawing of the Ainu. Very mysterious people. Very interesting people, quite frankly. By 1869, the imperial government decides we are going to establish farms on Ainu land. And so what do they do? What do they do with this mysterious people? Well, much like what the Americans did with the Native Americans, what the Germans did with the Herreros uh, time and time and time again. They kicked these people off of their ancestral lands and forced them to work the land. Uh, you move in ethnic Japanese onto this land um, and you farm it. And this is what they do to the Ainu. By modern definitions, genocide, certainly. They were not allowed to speak their own language. They were not allowed to uh, worship their, in their native Aboriginal religion. Um, many Ainu, because they were so discriminated against in the late 1800s, early 1900s, volunteer, vo voluntarily um, chose to breed, to uh, 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 marry Japanese, to, to try to, to, to breed out 
their their ethnicity and so that the future of their children might be better. They faced massive discrimination in Japan, still do in many pockets of Japan today. Very exotic look. The effects. Well, let me just give you some um, population numbers here. In the 1700s, there were approximately 80,000 Ainu, about 80,000 Ainu. Today, today, the official estimate uh, of the Ainu population in Japan is about 25,000. That being said, the number of so-called pure Ainu, full-blooded Ainu, about 300, about 300 are left. In 1966, there were 300 native Ainu speakers. Uh, in the last time they uh, did a study, 2008, they found less than 100. And so in a couple of generations, most likely the Ainu will be, uh, 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 that language might be extinct. However, recently in Japan, there have been growing movements um, with people of Ainu heritage um, to um, delve back to start practicing their original faith, to learn the language, the culture, etc. So there's hope for the Ainu. Um, something else that Japan copies from the Prussian model, and that is their militarism. That is their militarism. And we will see how Japanese militarism uh, affects its neighbors and soon the world. In our next lesson, Japan looks beyond the sea, looks beyond the sea and creates quite a storm in East Asia. But that is next time, my beautiful people. Thank you all very, very, very much until we meet again.